uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to thank the uh, organizing committee of the uh, Asian Gastro for inviting me to uh, this uh, conference. I think it's very important to gather together in the Asian uh, communities uh, to uh, share our knowledge and our practice. And this session also is uh, very important because nowadays we know that endoscopy gone uh, so far and uh, we have applied uh, endo advanced endoscopy techniques uh, to our practice, including early diagnosis, screening, and also the treatment. So in this lunch symposium, uh, which been kindly sponsored by Fuji Film, um, this will be a lecture by two uh, uh, distinguished uh, speakers. One is from Thailand, and another one is from our friend uh, from India. So i like uh, to introduce uh, both uh, speakers uh, one by one. So the first speaker um, is uh, Dr. Uh, Patum Thad uh, from uh, Thammasat uh, University. So clearly, Dr. Patum Thad, Pantum uh, Komon, uh, he's an assistant professor at Division of Gastroenterology, Department of Internal Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, Thammasat University. And uh, he earned uh, his uh, medi board of medicine and support of gastroenterology um, in Thailand. And uh, he also uh, further has his education uh, in um, IG Cancer Center as an advanced endoscopic fellowship and finished in 2017. And uh, at this time, he has published uh, several articles mostly related to the um, endoscopy. So today, uh, Dr. Patom Tat will give a lecture on emergent versus urgent ERCP for acute cholangitis. This is very important because we also would like to know that do we need to come emergent in the night time for patients with cholangitis or we can wait until tomorrow or on Monday uh, to go on ERCP in patients with acute cholangitis. So Dr. Patom Tat, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pradam Chai, for your kind introduction. And I would like to thank the organizing team of uh, Gastroenterology uh, Conference and the Fuji Film Company for allowing me to uh, lecture at this lunch symposium conference. And today my assignment is uh, emergent with uh, urgent ERCP for acute cholangitis. Cholangitis is a disease caused by an infection in the bile duct. The biliary tract is usually sterile, even if the duodenum contains organisms. This is because the biliary system has a protective mechanisms that prevent bacterial colonization. These protective mechanisms include bifold that flush the bacteria out of the biliary tract, or the sphincter that prevent the reflux of the adrenal content, by salt that suppress proliferation of bacteria. IgA and mucus that secrete from the biliary epithelium that prevents bacteria adherence, and the function of the tight junction and cover cells that prevent bacterial translocation into the portal venous system. When biliary obstruction occurs, these protective mechanisms become dysfunctional. Cholangitis, which is the, caused by the infection coming from the duodenum, also known as ascending cholangitis, is the most common type. Biliary tract stones are the most common cause of cholangitis, and occurring approximately about two thirds of the patients. Malignant biliary obstruction is the second most common cause, occurring about 20%. Before the acute ERCP, uh, I'm sorry, before acute cholangitis was treated by ERCP, the mortality of the patient with acute cholangitis was two to three times higher than today. Especially in the case requiring emergency surgery, the operative morbidity is up to 91% and mortality is up to 55%. Uh, so ERCP treatment is therefore a treatment method that can significantly reduce morbidities and mortalities. Currently, to solve the problem, of inconsistencies in the diagnosis of acute cholangitis. Diagnosis criteria have been established at a meeting of experts in Tokyo since 2007 and were revised in 2013 and 2018. 
the Tokyo Guideline 2018 Diagnostic Criteria consists of three criteria, a systemic sign of inflammation, polycesis, and imaging finding criteria. Systemic size of inflammation criteria has three sub-criteria, fever, elevated CRP, and elevated white blood cell count. Cholestasis criteria consists of three sub-criteria, jaundice, elevated total serum bilirubin, and abnormal biochemical test of liver more than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. Imaging finding criteria consists of two sub-criteria, the detection of really dilatation or the presence of cholangitis etiology, such as a stone or really tract sticture. The diagnosis of cholangitis have two levels of certainty. Patients with a certain diagnosis must meet all three criteria. For patients with a suspected diagnosis, one of the criteria for systemic signs of inflammation must be combined with either cholestasis or imaging criteria. In a follow-up study, 90% of patients with cholangitis diagnosed in real-life practice is covered by the Tokyo Guideline 2018 Diagnostic Criteria, with the remaining 10% not being covered due to the absence or not enough systemic inflammatory sign. Evaluation of the cholangitis severity is a process that followed the diagnosis. The Tokyo 2018 severity grading criteria is the most popular severity assessment divided into three grades. If any organ or system dysfunction is present, it is accessed as grade three. Without organ or system dysfunction, at least two highest features are classified as grade two. Grade two and grade three ineligible patients consider grade one or myocolangitis. Patients with a high uh, severity grade who associate with a high mortality rate. A prompt drainage of the biliary system provides source control for acute cholangitis and thereby decreasing bile and serum endotoxin, promoting the biliary excretion of IgA and antibiotics. Those clinical outcomes did not differ regardless of the sensitivity to the empiric antibiotic coverage. This implies that source control with prompt bleed drainage rather than targeted antimicrobial coverage impact patient outcome most. The best drainage method is ERCP, which is performed with a scope. The stone, the most common cause of acute cholangitis, can be removed in the same session. There are always controversial issues about the right time to do ERCP for patients with acute cholangitis. The definitions of emergent and urgent ERCP are not yet agreed upon. According to the several studies, the criteria for timing of ERCP are as follows. Emergent ERCP is defined as ERCP performed within three to 12 hours after hospital presentation, while urgent ERCP is defined as ERCP performed between 12 to 24 hours after hospital presentation. In addition, there will be a word early ERCP, which usually means ERCP done between 24 to 48 hours. And if ERCP is done after 48 hours from hospital admission, it is called delay ERCP. Recommendations regarding the timing of ERCP from international guidelines are based on the severity of acute cholangitis. In patients with mild or grade one cholangitis, all guidelines do not recommend emergent and urgent ERCP. However, in patients with moderate and severe cholangitis, there are significant difference in each guideline recommendation. For example, in patients with grade two acute cholangitis, the Tokyo guidelines recommend performing ERCP within 48 hours, and if possible, within 24 hours. This is because there is an information on Japanese and Taiwanese International Multicenter Retrospective Study supporting that it can reduce the day rate at 30 days. Why the ESGE and SGE guidelines do not emphasize this information and instead 
recommend doing early or delayed ERCP in this group of patients. In the first part uh, of my talk, I will discuss the clinical outcomes of ERCP treatment at various times and the evidence of the study to date. First, it must be clarified that the three important clinical outcomes in acute cholangitis that are used to determine the value of treatment are in hospital mortality, 30 day mortality, and lastly, persistent organ failure. Other clinical outcomes, including readmission, range of hospital stay, and cost reduction, are considered clinical outcomes that may be helped in further decision making in selecting the timing of ERCP. A nationwide analysis of the USA using data from the national inpatient sample database, including around uh, 4,500 people with acute cholangitis, found that performing ERCP within 48 hours was associated with a decrease in, in hospital mortality, 30 day mortality, and also 30 day readmission rate. This effect persists even when analyzing the subgroup of patients with severe cholangitis and patients with non-severe cholangitis. The same study also performed a sensitivity analysis uh, by treating the date of ERCP as a categorical variable and found that ERCP that was executed two days after the patient hospital admission date, uh, or as known as performing ERCP after 48 hours, was found to be significantly associated with increased mortality at 30 days. Meanwhile, if ERCP is performed within the day after the patient admission date, it will not be associated with a higher death rate compared to performing ERCP on the day of the hospital admission. So from this study, the 2021 ASGE guidelines state that ERCP in patients with acute cholangitis should not be performed later than 48 hours. Uh, another 2020 meta-analysis based on the data from 14 observational studies, uh, including uh, around uh, 84,000 patients with acute cholangitis, it found that urgent and early ERCP, including delayed ERCP, which performed before uh, 72 hours, uh, were associated with a significant reduction in in-hospital mortality. And also a single center a retrospective study in China on about 600 patients of acute cholangitis found that if the patient were divided into groups who received ERCP within 24 hours and after 24 hours, there was no significant difference in 30-day mortality rate. However, if uh, the patients were regrouped to ERCP difference uh, 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 within 48 hours and other 48 hours, uh, the patient who received ERCP within 48 hours had a lower 30 day death rate. Information from the uh, recent meta analysis and found similar results to the study shown in the previous slide, pooling the data from seven large non randomized studies, about uh, 88,000 patients. They found that performing ERCP within 24 hours reduced in hospital mortality and also length of stay, but did not uh, reduce 30 day mortality. And this study was done to test whether emergent ERCP would be uh, more beneficial in patients with cholangitis. Uh, it is a retrospective study and using the propensity score. Uh, to control the confounders by selecting the same number of patients to compare with the patient who received emergent ERCP. However, uh, neither ERCP within six hours nor 12 hours was associated with the benefit of reducing the length of hospital stay and in-hospital mortality. So in summary, uh, it can be seen that current information favors early ERCP rather than urgent or emergent ERCP as a sufficient uh, method to provide benefits for important clinical outcomes. Uh, this is because uh, early ERCP reduces uh, two important clinical outcomes. 
uh, including in hospital mortality and surgery day mortality. It is also beneficial in reducing the range of hospital stay. Okay, now I will discuss ERCP treatment outcome in patients with non-severe acute cholangitis and then later severe cholangitis. Uh, studies to date that have analyzed a non-severe case of cholangitis uh, have all been found to be uh, retrospective observational studies, most of which did not demonstrate a benefit in reducing in hospital and surgery day mortality. Uh, the exceptions are studies with many patients or studies that include patients in the moderate severity group. They show an association between early or urgent ERCP and decreased mortality. Uh, however, in patients with mild cholangitis, there often are benefits from emergent or urgent ERCP in reducing the range of hospital stay. Therefore, if it is not in a context of limitation of uh, facilities or personnel, emergent or urgent ERCP should also be performed in patients with non-severe acute cholangitis. Uh, as, far, uh, as for the study in patients with uh, severe acute cholangitis, uh, the association between early or urgent ERCP and decrease in hospital and 30 day mortality are seen in more study of severe case. Uh, while the effect on length of the hospital stay was not as clear as in the group of non-severe acute cholangitis patients. Uh, but it can be seen that between urgent ERCP within uh, 24 hours and early ERCP within 48 hours, uh, it is not clear which is the optimal timing. Uh, however, an interesting retrospective study in China found that uh, in patients with acute cholangitis with uh, neurological dysfunction or in patients with a serum lactate value of more than 2 mm per lit, emergent ERCP within 12 hours or associated with a decrease in hospital mortality. Uh, in acute cholangitis patients with renal dysfunction, abnormal white blood cell count, hyperbilirubinemia, or hypoalbuminemia, ERCP within 24 hours is associated with decrease in hospital mortality. And finally, uh, if the patient with uh, uh, hepatic dysfunction and those in whom the etiology of acute cholangitis is malignant obstruction, or in those with uh, high comorbidities, defined as a Charleston comorbidity index of more than three. ERCP within uh, 48 hours was associated with a decrease in hospital mortality. Now, therefore, uh, it will be seen that uh, all information uh, I present is from retrospective observational studies, which uh, have a low evidence, and a multi-center prospective cohort study or randomized control study uh, should be conducted. However, it is enough to show that performing e emergent ERCP within 12 hours has clearly uh, shown a benefit in the overall cases of a cholangitis patient, but it may be helpful in a subgroup of severe cholangitis with shock, neurological dysfunction, and uh, elevated serum lactate. Regarding urgent ERCP within 24 hours, there is no clear benefit in improving the important clinical outcomes compared with early ERCP within 48 hours. However, some evidence is uh, beginning to suggest that uh, urgent ERCP may be more appropriate in grade 3 patients with renal dysfunction or grade 2 patients uh, with abnormal white blood cell, high serum bleeding, and uh, low hypoalbumin. In addition, if the patient is in a hospital, with already facilities and expertise of ERCP, treatment with emergent ERCP uh, can reduce the hospital length of stay and possibly cost reduction. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, after reading and reviewing the information from various studies regarding the timing of ERCP, uh, I would like to summarize my decision flow as uh, follows. A uh, patient with my cholangitis. Uh, you can uh, treat by antibiotics and initial supportive management. And after that, uh, if the patient responds to the initial treatment, 
the decision can be made to choose uh, early or delayed ERCP, but not uh, later than uh, 72 hours, as there is no evidence to suggest that there is a mortality benefit in ERCP after, 40, uh, after 72 hours. Uh, but uh, suppose the patient does not respond to the initial management within 12 to uh, 24 hours. In that case, it is recommended to consider urgent or early ERCP. But if at that time there are both facilities and workforce with skilled ERCP endoscopies, emergent or urgent ERCP can be considered with the hope of reducing the length of hospital stay and cost. This line of consideration may also extend to the group of the patient with moderate cholangitis. In patients in the moderate activity groups with abnormal white blood cell, high sesame bilirubin, or low sesame albumin, urgent ERCP within 24 hours may be considered. However, early ERCP within 48 hours can be considered in other groups of patients. And finally, in patients with severe acute cholangitis, who have a septic shock, neurological dysfunction, or elevated serum lactate of more than two millimoles per lit, it is recommended to consider emergent ERCP within 12 hours. And urgent ERCP within 24 hours may be considered in patients with renal dysfunction, and early ERCP within 48 hours may be considered in other grade three patients. So that is all of my talk, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice talk. And uh, because of time limitation, so probably we keep the question uh, later if we still have time. Thank you very much for your nice talk. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Navin uh, Paul Walapu uh, from Yashoda Hospital in High Tech City, Hyderabad. So Dr. Navin earned um, MRCP, FRCP, CTT, in UK and also he earned liver transplant fellow in Birmingham in UK and he has been working in uh, uh, UK for uh, 13 years before he uh, moved to uh, Hyderabad, India and uh, even in India in Hyderabad he is very busy with all the endoscopy works and uh, but he still uh, keep uh, teaching uh, many fellows who come to his current hospital and also he continuing, uh, continues uh, teaching uh, in uh, MRCP uh, degree. And uh, he had several achievements, uh, for example, best hepatologist uh, by Times of India in 2022 and rising star in the field of gastroenterology by Times of India in uh, 2018. And certainly he has published uh, several uh, uh, medical literature in the liver and um, endoscopy field. So we are really lucky today uh, to have Dr. Navin to have a talk on uh, advanced EUS intervention in hepatopancreatic disease. And I think everyone knows nowadays that uh, EUS has been used in several purposes, uh, including intervention like uh, ability drainage, uh, pancreatic duct drainage, or uh, aberration or neurolysis blockade. And uh, also, the uh, EUS scope of the Fuji film is one of the best EUS scope uh, for the telepathic EUS, which I think uh, Navin will uh, totally agree with that. Uh, so I think um, we 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 lucky today that I have Dr. Navin uh, talk today. So Dr. Navin, please. Thank you so much, respected Chairman, Honorary Secretary, uh, Professor, uh, Moderator. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation. And it's an honor and privilege to be here with you all. Um, and as uh, Prof. already mentioned, endoscopic ultrasound has been making a lot of inroads into the endoscopic treatments. Um, and uh, I would like to share some of my slides uh, in this regard. And hopefully, uh, we'll get more understanding about these, um, uh, these interventions that we're going to see. And I thank Fujifilm for giving this opportunity. And uh, as we go through, I'll, I'll share some slides that we actually did on the Fuji scopes itself. So I think really endoscopic ultrasound came into picture somewhere around 25, 30 years ago. Uh, it was initially very rudimentary scopes that we had, you know, internal ultrasound scans. But I think the things have changed quite significantly. We're seeing a lot more advancements, both in terms of technology from the EUS point of view, and also we're able to reach the areas 
where which we're not able to reach before. So we're able to reach the inaccessible areas, do a lot of interventions with the with the EUS, both from radial and from the linear endoscopes as well. So I think biopsies uh, has become a common practice. So endoscopy biopsies have become a common practice. But I think what we're seeing lately is more therapeutic interventions where we can actually create a fistula between two different tracks and then put uh, a stents and decompress the ducts and, and the structures. Really, um, in terms of pancreatic malignancies particularly, we're seeing a lot of advancements but in the diagnostic and also in the, the therapeutic aspects like the pain management with the celiac plexus blocks that we do with the USS. Biliary drainages, whether it's biliary or enteric drainages, has made huge advancements. And also the newer things which are coming up is the radiotherapy, uh, the fusidal placements and also radiotherapy targeted therapies which we're doing with the EUS. So I'll, I'll just present with a case that we actually have recently done. Um, so it's a 55-year-old uh, male patient who has been diagnosed recently with diabetic diabetes. So for the juniors, anybody who is, presents with diabetes at an early stage, at a, at a, after 50 years, always think about pancreatic malignancies as one of the differential diagnoses. Um, so this patient had abdominal pain, jaundice, and these were the investigations clearly showing obstructive picture on the liver function test. C99 was slightly elevated, ultrasound and the CT showing a uh, pancreatic mass with double deck sign. So a question for the juniors, what would you do next? How would you proceed about this patient? Am I allowed to ask any questions here? No? Would you do ERCP or would you do EUS or go for surgery straight? So this is the algorithm that we generally should follow. So if there's a suspicion of uh, pancreatic cancers, you do a CT and MRI. First important imaging modality is always a CT, cross-sectional imaging. Um, if you suspect a pan pancreatic cancer, you do a biopsy. If it's resectable, then you go for surgery or neoadjuvant chemotherapy based on the stage of the cancer. If it is a um, unresectable cancer, then you can use other modalities of finding a diagnosis, either through an ultrasound-guided or a CT-guided biopsies. And then you go for the palliative treatments. Or if you have a uh, pancreatic cancer with metastatic disease, you do a biopsy of the lesion in the liver, get a diagnosis, and then you treat accordingly. Okay. So as I said earlier, the for the, for the pancreatic cancers, the first modality is always a CT scan. If the CT does not show any metastatic disease, any distant disease, then lo local regional staging, we should do it with the endoscopic ultrasound. And really, EOS scores over CT scan in local regional staging, particularly if the lesions are, you know, uh, less than two centimeters in size. Uh, and the advantage with the EOS is obviously you can acquire the tissue with the endoscopic ultrasound. And you can also assess the, the local resectability, particularly we want to look at the, the superior mesenteric vein, portal vein in invasion, and also the superior mesenteric artery and the, port and the, um, and the celiac axis involvement as well. So few studies which actually showed the overall sensitivity of the EUS is much higher compared to any of the other modalities like the CT ultrasound or the, the MRI. Clearly, the, the, C, the endoscopic ultrasound outscores uh, the CT and the, and the MRI uh, in these modalities. Um, if you look at this study, the, if you look at the pancreatic tumors less than 3 centimeters, EUS outscores in terms of the sensitivities compared to the, the MRI. And similarly, in patients with asymptomatic individuals, the U.S. has got better sensitivity compared to the MRI and the CT scan. Now, the other difficult scenario that we normally see in the practice is in a patient who's got chronic pancreatitis. So you see mass in a pan chronic pancreatitis background, so it's always very difficult to differentiate whether it is a malignant mass or whether it's a benign mass, because we often see benign masses in the chronic pancreatitis as well. So some of the pointers to say that it could be a malignant is if the size is more than two centimeters, or if they have irregular dilatation of the main pancreatic duct and the, and the branch duct, if the lesion is more vascular, and um, if there is absence of the cysts within the mass, and if there is any vascular invasion, that actually points towards malignancy. But we also do what we call the, uh, the elastography, uh, with which we can actually understand the, um, um, the nature of the lesion, the stiffness of the, of the, of the mass, and we can also uh, classify that as a malignant or a benign lesion. 
And of course, once you identify the lesion, you biopsy that lesion with the, uh, the endoscopic ultrasound guided biopsy, um, and uh, we get a diagnosis. We do what we call ROSE technique, where it's a basically rapid onset uh, specimen evaluation where we get a diagnosis pretty much straight away when we actually pass a sample. I would all, always recommend to get a ROSE for people who are actually doing USS because it actually gives an adi a diagnosis and adequate spe specimen. And uh, the diagnostic ability of the EUS, uh, obviously, positive predictive value is, is very good. So if you, get, if you have a lesion, if you're doing EUS, you pick up the lesion that has got a positive predictive value. That is a confirmed lesion, and you've got a diagnosis there. Compared to the ERCP-guided biliary brushings, the endoscopic ultrasound-guided biopsies are far more better because good specificity and very little complications compared to the ERCP. Obviously, with the ERCP, you have complications like the pancreatitis, which is almost up to the tune of 20 to 25%. So with the US-guided biopsies, the risk is almost negligible, 0.3 to 0.9% uh, with the endoscopic ultrasound guided. So if I had to choose a modality between the EUS or the ERCP for to make a diagnosis of pancreatic cancers um, or any, any kind of biliary uh, strictures, I normally go for endoscopic ultrasound as the first modality of choice. Most often what we do is we get a diagnosis with endoscopic ultrasound guided biopsy and the same sitting. Uh, once we get a diagnosis, we actually either decompress that either with a plastic stent if the patient is resectable, or we actually go with the metal stent if the patient is unresectable. So it makes it easy for us to get both the EUS and the ERCP at the same time. So who juniors who actually are interested in training about advanced endoscopies, who are interested particularly in hepatobiliary, I would recommend all of them to get trained both in ERCP and EUS because that actually, both of them are complementary skills which will help in treating your patients. And if you look at the, uh, the EUS compared to the nodal staging, vascular invasion, resectability, compared to the CT, EUS always fares better um, in terms of sensitivity and uh, specificity for the, for the lesions. Now, in terms of resectability of the, of the lesion on the EUS, CT, uh, EUS outscores on the CT, particularly if the lesions are even T1, T2, and even T3. Of course, if it is a nodal or a distant disease, then CT outscores on the, on the EUS. So, um, so com coming back to our case, so this patient had an EUS FNB which showed the histology or the rose showed it's an adenocarcinoma. So the case was actually borderline because this patient actually had SMV and portal vein inv invasion almost up to the uh, more than um, 180 degree contact of the SMV portal vein confluence of the mass with the, with the tumor. So that's why we didn't actually go for resection. It was a borderline dissectable case. So we ended up doing an ERCP and we put a CBD metal stent, fully covered metal stent. For any distant biliary strictures, we generally put a fully covered metal stents. Um, for any proximal strictures and anything from the CHD and proximally, like hyalur strictures, we tend to put an uncovered stents because we don't want to block the, the other, other segment of the biliary drainage. Uh, and we also don't want to block the cystic duct. Okay, so this patient, we actually decompressed it. The jaundice got better, and then he went for neoadjuvant chemotherapy after, after that. Three months later the, of the chemotherapy, he presented with jaundice again. So, and when we did the imaging studies, it showed that he's got obstruction of, of the stent, and also now he's actually got gastric altered obstruction. So, so this chap, three months later, presented with duodenal infiltration with both CBD obstruction, and he's also got gastric outer obstruction. So here are the options that we have. For CBD blockage, you can put a restent with the ERCP, or you can go with PTBD, or you can also do EOS guidability drainage. For duodenal obstruction, either you can go with putting a duodenal stent or enteral SEMS, and then do an ERCP, or you can do an EOS guided gastrojejunostomy. So previous to the EOS days, what we used to do is either go for PTBD, um, but I'll say, share some slides with you why EUS guided drainages are much better than the, the PTBD. Uh, and also we used to go for diurnal stents. And again, I'll show some slides about the evidence between randomized control trials com comparing the, uh, the enteral stenting versus the surgical GJ versus the endoscopic ultrasound guided um, GJs. So this guy, we ended up doing the endoscopic ultrasound guided biliary drainage. Um, and the, as, as we discussed earlier. So the, that endoscopic ultrasound guided the two options, two ways of doing it, uh, what we call a, in fact, the three ways, uh, I would say. 
one is you can actually if you can access into the the distal cbd that's the best way of doing it okay what we call an endoscopic ultrasound guided cds or or cholecystostomy duodenostomy so you you puncture it from here and then you pass a wire and then you put a stent here the other way of doing it is called a rendezvous procedure where you actually puncture it get the wire into the bile duct through the ampulla and then you put a stent through that again through the ampulla um, that's called a rendezvous procedure but for that you need to have an access to the ampulla so in our case we obviously we can't do the rendezvous procedure because it's got a gastric artery obstruction so uh, the other option the third option is you can do an ears guided puncture from the stomach into the liver segment 2 segment 3 ducts called endoscopic guide uh, ultrasound guided hepatogastrostomy so in this, in our case we were difficult to get into the ampulla uh, into the diod into the um, pyloric complex as well so that's why we ended up doing the endoscopic ultrasound guided uh, eos guided uh, uh, hepatogastrostomy so if you compare the eos guided drainages with the ptbd in patients who actually had failed erp if you look at the clinical success rate is almost similar between both the uh, both the groups both the eos and the ptbd however if you look at the reintervention rates in the adverse events eos outscores compared to the ptbd group similarly other studies which actually show there is no technical difference in either of the groups however if you look at the clinical success is much better with the eos guided the few adverse post procedure adverse events and risk of reintervention is very low with endoscopic ultrasound guided gastrogenostomies another study which which actually compared doing directly eos guided drainages versus going for ercp as a primary intervention normally we go with eos as a as a second line only if the ercp fails but this study actually looked at what if the patient has got obstruction and instead of going for ercp why don't i just put a directly in eos guided biliary drainage this study actually was was uh, uh, very revealing because it actually showed the adverse events are much less when you actually put an eos guided biliary drainage rather than doing an ercp probably because the the drainage is is achieved much better way with the eos guided biliary drainage and risk of tumor blockage to the stent is much less because you're actually bypassing the tumor we are actually going above the tumor so chances of it getting blocked is less and the, the stent would last for longer time so the advantages of having eos guided is low risk of procedure related pancreatitis longer state stent patency therefore decrease risk of reintervention increase quality of life and also complications are much less and obviously these are the complications that we would expect or we should be careful when you're doing eos guided eos guided drainages are more advanced procedures i would recommend that you should be getting trained by an expert um and i think we should be i think the competence levels you'd only achieve after doing at least 25 to 30 of these eos guided drainages so i wouldn't recommend doing it straight away by yourself you should have a trainer or supervisor with you because these are complicated procedures but yes they are very uh, heartwarming and relieving when you actually do them so our case as i said we actually put a eos guided hepatic gastrostomy and we were able to drain it so these these are different types of stents uh, i will not go through because of the of the time uh, constraints um this is another one which is a eos guided uh, cds or cyst gastrostomy that we do so we kind of achieved biliary drainage now this guy has also got gastric outlet obstruction so we need to relieve that all as well okay so this is how it is done the eos guided so you have the stomach and then uh, you have the tumor here obviously you can't get through this here so what we do is we put a nasal biliary drain a uh, tube and um, there's also a certain uh, balloons called e pass balloons which we don't have it in our country but i think japan Prof professor in inotoi has actually uh, invented this um and um, with that balloon you can actually inflate both the sides of the balloon create a, a, a inflated area of the jejunum then you puncture it with the uh, under under the years guided and then you put a hot axis or sparks uh, or a nagi stent through it the complications of eos guided gj perforation peritonitis hemorrhage and also luminal obstruction of the with the food impaction and uh, obviously we should avoid the eos guided drainages in patients who actually have large volume ascites or if they have any large collaterals so the study which actually 
comparing the years guided gastroenterostomy or jejunostomy with the surgical GGA. If you look at the adverse events are much less with the EUS compared to surgical jejunostomy. And all the other outcomes like technical success, clinical outcomes, recurrence of GO are, are, are comparable between the, both, the, both the groups. Another meta-analysis which actually looked at compar comparing the EUS guided GJ versus either duodenal stenting or whether you go for surgical GJ or, or laparoscopic GJ, um, all of them showed the good technical and clinical success rate and all of them actually showed that the recurrence rates of the malignancy is much lower with the endoscopic ultrasound guided drainage. So this is our case where actually inflated with the balloon and then we managed to actually put this hot axios stent. So this guy's LFT is improved and uh, he's, he's currently doing well. In fact, he had pain and uh, that's the reason why we actually ended up doing a EOS guided uh, celiac plexus neurolysis for him as well. This is another case. I'm not sure whether we'll be able to play here. Help in playing it, please. This is another case which I actually wanted to show you how we actually did the US guided in real time. So this guy, as you can see, there's a lot of intrapatic dilatation, this guy. So he has got a puncture. We did a cholangiogram, and then we put a stent there. Because that's how the endoscopic plate looks like, the metallic stent into the stomach. So that's the directly puncturing the, the left ducts of the liver through the stomach wall. And the same. And this is another case, the same case, actually, where we actually so we can play it here. Yeah. So this is the jejunum I was talking about. So we actually inflated the jejunum through the, and through the stomach we punctured it, and then we put a, a stent, which you will see the hot axis coming up soon. Sure, they're able to see, but you can see. Uh, I, was able, I was going to show you a, a stent coming from there, but I think it, it's not playing up very well. But the next slide is, is post, post putting the, the stent, we are able to go into the jejunum uh, through, the, through that stent. Another procedure called edge procedure, uh, which patients who actually have ruined Y bypass procedure and they come with the bilirubin obstruction. So, previously, uh, conventionally, what they used to do is the surgeons used to do a laparoscopy, give us an axis into the afferent limb, and then we used to go in and then do the perform the ERCP. But this is something called edge procedure where you connect between it between the remnant stomach and the the, the stomach which is uh, which is uh, in connection with the small bowel. You puncture it and you put a hot axial stent there, and through that you go and get an axis, go into the um, into the, uh, the afferent limb, and then you perform the ERCP. So this is edge procedure, which was actually been done uh, in, from 2014 onwards. At, and comparing the, between the, uh, the laparoscopic-assisted ERCP versus the, the edge procedure, again, similarly, good uh, technical success rates and less adverse events, and also time taken to do the procedure at edge is much less compared to the, uh, the laparoscopic-guided uh, ERCP procedures. I'll not dwell on this in the interest of the time, but essentially what I wanted to show you is endoscopic ultrasound field is expanding. A lot of new interventions. I already showed you two or three different interventions, which actually US has made, made huge progress and in inroads. But the other things like uh, putting the furicil markers, radiotherapy markers, doing anti-tumor agents into the tumor, um, and also tattooing, which will help for the surgeons to actually understand, identify the pancreatic lesions. Um, so there are so many new advances which is coming up. The EOS guided bracket therapy, as I was telling earlier, radio frequency ablation with using endoscopic ultrasound guided. So there are a lot of interventions which are happening. So any 
any area that you can actually see from the GI tract outside, like for example, taking lesions for biopsies from pancreas, adrenal gland, kidneys, you can do all those things very easily with the endoscopic ultrasound uh, guided. Of course, there are problems with the US. You need to know how to use the machine and how and, and, and also the complications. Um, and especially if the patient actually got severe ascites, poor coagulation, uh, uh, coagulopathy, we should not be attempting US guided drainages, drainages for these patients. And as I said, bleeding, inf infection, leak, maldeployment of the stents. Um, so this is what we say, uh, the different grades of maldeployment. So grade type one is actually when you actually couldn't achieve the uh, into the jejunum. Type two is where you achieved, but you made it there of the type three, and then the type four, you actually go and gone into the into the colon. So most of the EUS guided drainages complications are type one, which is thankfully are not that common. Um, but type four are very rare, which is which is good. But I think it's very important that you get trained by a good endoscopic ultrasound. Um, um, uh, expert. So in summary, um, the U.S. has made a huge inroads into the, into the uh, progress in terms of managing our patients with the pancreatic cancers. Uh, certainly, um, um, the benefits of endoscopic ultrasound guided hepatico gastrostomy, uh, gastrogenostomy are, are, are huge. And I would recommend, as I said, to get trained in, the, in these kind of uh, uh, procedures. And uh, we're happy to announce that um, uh, Yeshada Hospital's I've collaborated with the with the Fujifilm uh, company, and uh, we are conducting training programs uh, as one of the uh, one of the few Asia Pacific training centers uh, in endoscopy, both in basic and the advanced endoscopy. So, any fellows or juniors who would like to pursue their uh, for training, we are happy to have you guys. Uh, you can contact Fujifilm as well, so that we can uh, uh, recruit us for the for the training programs. And thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Navin. So nice and uh, comprehensive uh, lecture. But because of the time limitation, probably we have uh, no time uh, for question. I'm pretty sure that uh, Navin and Patom Tat will be around here for an entire day. If you have uh, any question or something else, uh, please uh, uh, feel free uh, to uh, ask him. Thank you very much. Thank you.